Okay, well, first of all, thank you everyone for uh, joining us for AppSell's first webinar, which is um, being organized in collaboration with the Energy Studies Institute and World Wildlife Fund. Um, we are absolutely delighted that we have around 150, well, we have 159 participants online with us now and uh, perhaps a few more joining us later. Um, I'm going to first introduce our speakers before handing over the floor to uh, Melissa and Eric, who are going to serve as the co-hosts of this afternoon's session. So, first of all, it gives me great honor to introduce um, Sandeep Chamling Rai, who is Senior Advisor on Global Climate Adaptation Policy at WWF. He has been with the WWF Singapore office since 2009 and leads WWF's global policy work in adaptation. He has, had more, he has more than 17 years of working experience in, on climate change issues both domestically and globally. Sandeep has been an active participant in the UN climate negotiation process since 2003. At the negotiations, he has represented the government of Nepal as well as WWF. Um, Sandeep has also implemented various climate change projects such as in climate adaptation, glacial research, renewable energy, clean development mechanism, and science-based targets. Sandeep is a graduate of the NUS Masters of Science in Environmental Management, class of 2013, as well as Pokhara University in Nepal. Um, I then now introduce um, Melissa Lowe, uh, a dear friend and colleague who has been extremely supportive of Epsel's work, and I'm very grateful for that. Melissa is a research fellow at the Energy Studies Institute she has participated in the UN um, climate negotiations for over a decade and is an active sustainability thought leader, authoring, publishing, and presenting at various forums. Melissa is the designated contact point for NUS accreditation to the UNFCCC and serves on the nine-member steering committee of the Research and Independent Non-Governmental Organization Constituency under the UNFCCC. UNFCCC sorry. Melissa's current research focus is on transparency of climate action and support um, reporting in Southeast Asia. Um, we are very delighted to also share that uh, Melissa is um, also a graduate of the MSc in Environmental Management at NUS. Uh, she also holds a Master's in Climate Change Law and Policy from the University of Strathclyde and is a graduate of the Faculty of Geography in NUS. And finally, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Eric. Eric Beer is a researcher at the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law. His research focuses on the making of international climate change law, following the developments of the Paris Agreement's modalities, procedures, and guidance, with a specific focus on the sustainable development mechanism and internationally transferred mitigation outcomes. Um, Eric has had great experience in capacity building in relation to the Paris Agreement with youth and educators in Singapore. He works with various stakeholders to develop new frameworks for students and educators to better understand the Paris Agreement. Eric has attended the past two uh, Conference of the Parties, contributing to the policy work of the Young People's Constituency at COP24. Eric is a graduate of um, the NUS Law School. Um, graduating of, of the class 2019. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over the mic to, um, uh, to uh, Melissa, who will also, um, I guess, um, transfer me to the audience and I'm going to uh, let the um, presenters uh, share their expertise and thoughts for the next hour. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much, Jolene. Okay, I'm going to move you to attendee, so your video will disappear. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Jolene. And I also wanted to say thank you so much to all of you uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Could be morning or evening from if you're uh, joining us from overseas. Thank you so much for your support and also like to thank Epsel, of course, for organizing this uh, webinar and to Epsel and WWF for your partnership. Uh, so as Jolene mentioned, my name is Melissa Lowe. I'm a research fellow at the Energy Studies Institute at NUS and I'll be moderating this afternoon's webinar. Uh, I'd like to go over some admin uh, details first before we start uh, so to let you know how this uh, webinar will proceed. 
uh, the speakers will each have 15 minutes to cover um, their designated slides. So we, we have it all in one slide deck, so to minimize uh, interruptions. Uh, and uh, we'll aim to finish, as mentioned uh, a bit earlier, if you, were, if you joined at the beginning, uh, we'll aim to uh, finish our presentations at about four o'clock. So we'll have an hour for Q&A. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to two functions of this webinar. So you really would have noticed that you can't um, put on your video. Uh, we've also just realized that people can't see the other attendees. Uh, we apologize for that. Um, that function may not be, we might not be able to turn on that function at this point. Um, and so you have two functions that you can access. One is the chat room, which I know some of you have already accessed, so the Zoom webinar chat. Now this function will be used to let us know if we need to slow down our pace, or you can't hear us or you can't see the slides properly. So please use this function primarily for um, letting us know things. For the question and answer, there's also a, a specific function for this. You'll see it as Q&A, two little chat boxes, uh, speech bubbles rather, right, um, in, your, in your Zoom webinar. Uh, please use this to convey questions to the speakers, uh, which we will take uh, from four o'clock. Um, in order to minimize disruption and distraction, we all of us will be closing these boxes uh, during the presentation itself. So we may not be able, we won't be able to address the questions as they come, uh, but we will we'll take them uh, from four o'clock onwards. Okay, so um, yes, without further ado, uh, we can start. All right, so I hope you enjoy the presentation and find it useful. All right, so I'm the first speaker actually. All right, here we go. So um, today we have a, we'll be presenting on the Paris Agreement at the COVID crossroads. Uh, this topic, of course, is extremely important uh, given that there have been some announcements that the uh, COP26, which was scheduled for Glasgow this year, has been postponed. The new dates are already announced uh, to the public. Uh, we'll cover that in a bit as well. So this is the overall topic. In terms of contents, uh, this is what we'll be covering. Uh, I will be covering the COP25 outcomes for mitigation and transparency under the Paris Agreement. I will then hand over uh, to Eric, who will be covering carbon markets and cooperation. Uh, towards these markets. And then Sandeep will take over from Eric and cover adaptation and loss and damage under the Paris Agreement. I will then take it back from him to cover uh, COVID-19 impacts on the Paris Agreement. And finally, Eric will cover US, the, the, the issue of the US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. Right, so for the benefit of those of you who uh, may not be familiar with the Paris Agreement, uh, we thought we might cover this uh, very briefly. Uh, I would encourage uh, those of you who have, not, uh, who have not read the Paris Agreement to do so. Okay, um, the Paris Agreement is of course a landmark agreement uh, adopted in 2015 in Paris, France, and this was unanimously agreed by all countries at that time. Uh, it entered into force 11 months after it was adopted in Paris, and this is uh, an unprecedented uh, achievement for any international treaty. Uh, the Paris Agreement uh, means that countries have agreed to hold the increase of global temperature to two degrees um, Celsius above pre-industrial levels, um, and to pursue efforts to limit this temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Uh, and they recognized that this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts of climate change. And this can be found in Article 2, Paragraph 1 of the Paris Agreement. Uh, I would also like to draw your attention to a document called Decision 1 CP21. And this document must be read together with the Paris Agreement because it, because it outlines what countries need to do in order to what we call operationalize the Paris Agreement. So what are the rules? How, how does one make sure that the Paris Agreement reaches its, its objective, right? Uh, what's important in the Paris Agreement is that uh, unlike its predecessor, the Kyoto Protocol, which I know many of you might be familiar with, uh, the Paris Agreement covers all countries, right, that are party to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And uh, it also requires all countries, not just the developed countries, to put forward national targets to, to address climate change. Now, 
The Paris rulebook is an important part of uh, the Paris Agreement because countries uh, were originally supposed to put it together in three years, uh, keeping in mind that the Paris, they, they figured that the Paris Agreement would not enter into force perhaps so quickly, but it did 11 months after. Okay, so there is what we call a threshold for entry, right? Threshold for entry, which is uh, found in the Paris Agreement. Uh, and what this says is that once 55 uh, countries representing 55% of global emissions uh, ratify the Paris Agreement, it will enter into force. And this was achieved when the US, China, the two largest emitters had already committed to the Paris Agreement and uh, Europe had also committed to the Paris Agreement uh, and it entered into force on 4th of November 2016. So countries actually did um, make good on time and they completed most of the rulebook in 2018. What we'll be covering today is uh, the outcomes of COP25, of course, but most of the rulebook was actually completed a year before that, right? So in Katowice in COP24. Uh, so if those of you who, who are interested, and I know this presentation will go quite quickly over some of the details, uh, please do go online and download uh, a copy of the Katowice Climate Package. That's where you'll find all of the details uh, that were agreed in uh, Katowice. But for the benefit of just giving some context to what we'll be sharing, um, COP24 in Katowice was the deadline right, that was set up by the uh, Paris Agreement uh, and it was held in Katowice, Poland from the 2nd to the 14th of December in 2018 after three years of negotiations. So in, in the middle there was the Marrakesh COP22, uh, the Fiji uh, held uh, COP that was uh, actually done in Bonn, in Germany, uh, and also a number of mid-year sessions uh, that took place before. The idea was to get to a single set of guidelines in order to operationalize the 2015 Paris Agreement. Uh, one of the outcomes, uh, however, was that uh, because the, Par the Paris rulebook, like with all negotiations, is, a, is an outcome of negotiations, and ultimately, uh, because of the diverse interests from all countries, developed, developing, and everyone else in between, uh, the outcome was actually fairly, uh, it gave very wide latitude right, uh, in terms of outcomes. And I'll be covering the mitigation and uh, transparency, which thankfully both were, were agreed uh, for the most part in, in Katowice. There were some shortfalls and uh, Eric will be go going over uh, Article 6, which is actually one of the major issues that uh, have, has not been agreed yet. Okay, so mitigation and transparency. Now, I've, what I've taken to do here is to use a traffic light format, okay? Um, so some of you may have seen, seen this before. Um, right, so the greens were, the, the text in green is, uh, are issues that were agreed at COP24 in Katowice, okay? So the, the nationally determined contribution guidance and accounting, uh, Article 4, was agreed in, in COP24. Uh, however, one of the major issues uh, that has not been agreed, that's why it's in red, there's no consensus, is the issue of common timeframes. And I'll go over this in the next slide. Uh, transparency of action and support was also largely agreed at COP24. However, some of the specific tables uh, where countries will need to input inventory, right, national greenhouse gas inventory data has not been agreed. So they have an outline, more or less, um, they're negotiating these outlines right now, um, and they're partially, they were partially agreed at COP25, but further details will still need to be uh, agreed and negotiated. Uh, market and non-market mechanisms, Article 6, there was uh, completely no consensus at all, and this will be was supposed to be taken up at COP25, but countries failed to come to consensus and therefore will be taken up at COP26, which was supposed to be this year. But of course, with COVID-19, uh, it has had to be postponed and it will take place in COP26 in uh, 2021. Climate finance reporting uh, was also partially agreed uh, and further details will need to be negotiated. Uh, the global stock take, which will begin in 2023, which what it does essentially is to take stock of collective action of all countries. Uh, this was also agreed, as well as the compliance committee of Article 15. So the Katowice 
climate package or the Paris rule book is more or less there. Uh, we have 144 pages and counting. And I'd just like to point out to you that the rule book of the Kyoto Protocol is called the Marrakesh Accords. And uh, that document itself, which essentially puts forward the rules for um, how countries would uh, operationalized the Kyoto Protocol, so primarily the 37 industrialized countries, that rule book was 245 pages. What this means is that the Katowice Climate Package, this, or the Paris rule book, is not reinventing the wheel uh, for the most part. It's actually building on existing arrangements, building on existing structures under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, even drawing from some of the rules from the Kyoto Protocol. All right, so keep in mind that the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change started in 1992, it's been 20-odd years, and so there's a whole, you know, uh, history behind uh, some of these discussions and outcomes. Okay, so moving quickly to uh, what was, uh, what were some of the outcomes for uh, NDCs in COP25. So here you have um, Article 410, uh, the Conference of Parties serving as the meeting of the parties to this agreement. Okay, so this is a mouthful. Uh, essentially, the parties to the com the parties to the UN Convention on Climate Change. Okay, uh, they meet as the Conference of Parties. That's it. So the COP, right? So COP26 essentially is the 26th meeting of the Conference of the Parties, which is the, the umbrella agreement, right? The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, that's the, the, the main agreement. And then the Kyoto Protocol is the, the second agreement that was agreed in 1997. Uh, the third agreement is the Paris Agreement. Okay, so when you see this long sentence called the Conference of the Parties serving as the meeting of the parties to this agreement or the Paris Agreement, uh, it refers to this uh, acronym called CMA. Okay, so um, we are now at, I think, the second meeting of the CMA. Uh, we'll be going into the third, if I'm not mistaken. So the parties to the Paris Agreement shall consider common timeframes for nationally determined contributions. So nationally determined contributions are essentially the pledges that countries have to make under the Paris Agreement, okay? Um, and these have to be updated every five years. Uh, this year being the fifth year from 2015, uh, countries have to submit uh, new targets. They can also choose to re-communicate the same target or update them slightly so as to uh, uh, ensure that there's some progress or increase in ambition. Okay, the issue here with common time frames is that current the current set of nationally determined contributions, I believe there are about 182 of them, they're in all shapes and sizes, okay? Um, some of them are five-year targets, some of them are 10-year targets. Most of them envisage meeting uh, whatever numbers that they put up by 2030, okay? Um, so the idea here is to ensure that at some point, probably 2031, all NDCs will have a common time frame, either five years, 10 years, or five plus five. Okay, and this is tricky because countries will need to update them every five years, okay, which means it can be difficult to sync up with political cycles internally, uh, domestically. And so uh, this is a very contentious issue because um, the international negotiations facing team, they may be made up of key diplomats, all right, career diplomats, and they will have to confer uh, very greatly and intensely with their domestic po uh, policy makers uh, in order to ensure that the common timeframes are feasible, okay? So parties were not able to agree on conclusions in COP25 and they opted to go with rule 16 of the draft rules. Um, and this essentially is to carry forward the issue to the next meeting. And I think the problem with this is that um, the longer it takes to decide, this might delay the update of internal domestic processes. Uh, to countries when they put forward their new NDCs, okay? Okay, so in terms of transparency, which essentially means reporting, okay, so the nationally determined contributions that countries have to put forward are voluntary, of course, they're nationally determined, uh, which means that it might be difficult to uh, track progress because they're in all shapes and sizes as I mentioned. So the idea here is to ensure that there are tables that have the same indicators for all countries to report 
those indicators, right? So it's, it's easier for whoever is tracking, be it the UNFCCC secretariat or observers like ourselves, researchers, to access those tables uh, to understand collective action. Okay, so in, in Madrid, COP25, uh, the countries were able to uh, come to some I uh, idea about uh, the tables. They have an outline, okay, but the plan was to, so if you see the text box that I've copied and pasted onto this slide, you'll see that the timeline was not supposed to be uh, COP25, okay? So the timeline for agreeing on these uh, transparency report uh, tables was actually this November. Okay, so I wouldn't be too worried because some timelines are a bit longer than others. Uh, so when we come to Eric's topic, you'll see that actually the, we've already way exceeded uh, that deadline. Okay, but for at least uh, these reports, the reason why the timeline is uh, slightly more relaxed is because uh, the enhanced transparency framework will only come into force in 2024. Okay, so we're in 2020, we still have four years, so countries will only need to use these tables for the first time in 2024, okay? And the UNFCCC Secretariat is already conducting training programs in order to upskill and build capacity in developing countries because they've usually not been required. So under the, the previous arrangements or the current arrangements, they've not been required to use these tables, okay? So what are some of the possible outcomes of COP26, uh, which will be happening next year? Uh, one is to finalize the transparency issues that I've just mentioned. And uh, something that I did not cover uh, just uh, for this uh, slide deck and for this presentation is Article 15, which is compliance, right, or implementation, uh, facilitation and compliance. So um, the Article 15 committee, which is a team of uh, experts and negotiators who will be trying to enforce the rules of NDC accounting and transparency, they are expected to come up with their rules of procedure. And this will be very important because uh, this article is supposed to, this committee is designed to serve as a deterrent for non-compliance, okay? So uh, if you have any questions on Article 15, I'm happy to take them later. But now I will pass on the time to Eric, who will be covering markets and cooperation. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mel. Um, so this is um, Article 6 in the Paris Agreement. So you can see that badge that was given out last year at the Madrid Corp. All I want for Christmas is Article 6, which shows you exactly how long we've been waiting for an outcome for Article 6 without any outcome. Um, this was actually meant to be completed at COP24. Uh, it got rolled over under Rule 16 of the Rules of Procedure of the uh, Conference of the Parties to COP25. Uh, COP25 we went overboard by, by 44 hours, almost two days. Still couldn't get a result, so now we're here. So uh, Mel, next slide please. So if you're still wondering uh, what this Article 6 thing is, uh, let me just go through it very briefly. Uh, Article 6, the three major clauses that you will need to look at will be 6.2, the Internationally Transferred Mitigation Outcomes, or the ITMOS for short, 6.4, the Sustainable Development Mechanism, which is not an official term, but it is a term that has been used by many negotiators, reporters, and observers informally. So the question mark next to the S refers to the fact that um, this is actually meant to be a uh, it's meant to be the Paris Agreement's version of the Clean Development Mechanism, but it's also supposed to deliver sustainable development. So, but how sustainable is it is something that is, you know, the devil's in the details. And then 6.8, non-market cooperation, which refers to bilateral and multilateral cooperation, which does not involve the use of uh, markets or uh, there's no buying and selling of things that might be direct financial or technological transfer, but or just uh, capacity building, but definitely not in terms of market pricing. So as mentioned earlier, um, not completed, but for the first time after um, four COPs later, we have clean tax coming out of COP25 for 6.2, 6.4, and 6.8. If you look at a typical draft tax, there will be brackets and options, which means that countries have not reached a generally agreed position amongst themselves. And for the first time, we have seen a clean tax without any of these options. However, um, the official outcome of Article 6 uh, was a procedural outcome, which, meant, uh, which simply said that we would carry on doing this next year. It actually 
stated that these so-called clean tags were not the finalized position of parties. That means that they could be reopened once again at next year's COP. So this is something that don't get too excited about for now. And uh, another interesting outcome that turned up at COP25 was the creation of the San Jose High Ambition Coalition. Uh, why San Jose? I believe San Jose is the capital of Costa Rica, if I'm not wrong, which was one of the uh, which was the host of the pre-COP 25 uh, conference. So um, the day before uh, the close of the COP, I, if I'm not wrong, it came right after the uh, the clean tax for 6.2 and 6.8 came out, and they actually had a set of principles that they were going that they stated that if the outcome for Article 6 did not include these principles, um, they would not they would actually uh, vote down this uh, outcome at the COP. And you remember the COP uh, works on consensus. That means that any one country can bring down the entire resolution. So who is in this high ambition coalition? You have 18 of the EU members, um, as well as the EFTA members like Norway and Switzerland. And uh, I can't remember which, I think either Iceland or like Liechtenstein, one of them, uh, 11 developing countries, as well as New Zealand and the United Kingdom. So the, what are the San Jose principles? First, environmental integrity. So um, whatever you do, you cannot, uh, in, in terms of creating a uh, carbon offset or a mitigation, you cannot harm other aspects of the problem, such as uh, pollution or loss of biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, overall mitigation in global emissions. So um, there's a, the discussion here is that should we, in uh, for every unit of um, carbon that is be, carbon mitigation that is for every unit of carbon that is being mitigated, should we um, immediately dock off a certain percentage of the credits to be cancelled even before it's issued, so that there is already a form of inbuilt uh, mitigation in the system stuff, or should it be simply uh, one for one offsetting? So overall mitigation in global emission is basically a way of saying we want to have this so-called tax on the uh, credits being issued. A uh, single unit of accounting, CO2E, uh, carbon dioxide equivalent, um, because there are some countries who design their first NDCs without mentioning uh, any redu reduction in their carbon emissions, whether it be absolute uh, or in terms of carbon sensitivity or below a certain uh, projected business as usual model. Uh, I think Saudi Arabia is one of those countries which has did not mention CO2 in its entire NDC. So there's a, a worry that if we have different units, uh, especially in 6.2, all over the place, how are we going to ensure that what each unit is comparable to each other? How do we know that countries are on the right track? How do we know that these, especially in 6.2 and 6.4, how are they going to be tradable with each other and uh, equivalent to each other? We don't know. So that's why we have to put them together uh, to ensure that they are all measured in terms of CO2E. Share for adaptation. Um, the clean development mechanism actually had a certain 2% of all uh, transactions uh, put into the uh, UNFCCC's adaptation fund. So basically they want this to also exist in uh, Article 6.2 and 6.4. No double counting. Um, some developing countries have proposed that um, when a unit of mitigation is, is created that both the country that is selling and both the country that is buying both get offset from their uh, carbon accounts. That means that it's cancelled twice. That means there's double counting. That means that the when you total up the numbers for all the different countries' emissions, you will see a big gap between um, the accounts and the reality. So the no double counting is a way of saying that we have to decide which country gets to cancel off the emissions or they could also find a, a, some alternative way of accounting, but it cannot be double counted, that's all. No Kyoto Carol access allowances. Um, Australia actually came to last year's call saying that uh, we actually have access um, uh, emission allowances from the Kyoto era where every country was given a certain target to reduce the emissions by. Uh, Australia somehow managed to uh, bar bargain for a hundred and five percent of their baseline, and they cut the emissions at ninety something percent of the baseline. So they actually have a certain amount of extra emissions that, under the old Kyoto rules, they could sell to other countries. 
But it, uh, in the Paris Agreement, carols are not a, a thing at all. Every country has so NDCs. So um, this actually caused quite a bit of um, concern amongst negotiators. And so the, the San Jose coalition came out very strongly against uh, carol trading. And uh, CDM credit is carried over. So some countries have a lot of CDM projects in their countries. They want to carry it for, forward. Um, the position being adopted by San Jose uh, coalition is your projects can carry over if it meets the new standards of uh, Article 6, but um, not the credits themselves. Um, so as you can see, the parties that have a lot of uh, vested interest in uh, the CDM include the BRICS. So um, Brazil, Russia, China, India, South Africa, not all the BRICS are equally opposed. I recall that Brazil and China were putting out very strong defense against uh, some of the San Jose principles last year because they have a lot of uh, CDM and uh, RADD projects which also feed into the CDM. Japan and Korea also have some um, um, experience in the CDM. They have funded some CDM projects and uh, they certainly do not want to see their project being struck off the list or cannot or not being able to be grandfathered into the uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. So that's something that you can see where the tensions are and um, it's something we will have to see how it develops next year. Next month. So, um, uh, yes. So, uh, so let's take a look and maybe take out our crystal balls for a moment and try to make some educated guesses as to what the COP26 outcomes are. Now that we have um, an additional year to for parties to talk to each other offline and to try to uh, see whether they can reach a, a common position. Um, there are certain outcomes that are going to be more likely to happen and less, some that are less likely to happen now. Um, but the most orthodox position that is being taken by most parties right now is that Nothing's agreed until everything's agreed. So six, two, six, four, six, eight, all have to be agreed at the same time. Um, that is going to be a bit of a problem because we know from last year uh, that six, two, and six, eight actually came up um, with their clean text ahead of six, four. But at the same time, the problem is that, that six, four, is and six, two have to come up together in lockstep because they use very similar languages. Because they have. Um, they're both about trading credits. So you have to trade your credits in a fairly similar way if they are to be coherent with each other and so that it will also make sense in the global stock take in 2023. So if the, the standards and the uh, units of measure and the system are broadly the same, then you'll have a much easier time in 2023. Um, however, the problem is that there is some sensing that countries may actually not know how big this market is until they see the results of the global stock in 2023. Where is this, the actual gap in emissions? Uh, how large is it? What's the scope of um, the, the size of the market as well as who are the likely people to want to buy these credits? So that, if we wait, we might end up waiting until 2023 or later, which May, may result in more, um, more robust uh, Article 6. That could be a possibility, but it could also result in um, a question as to what to do with the current CDR projects. Option two is to pick up the low-hanging fruit first. So Article 6.8, because it doesn't concern markets, it could actually proceed ahead of 6.2 and 6.4. However, it's also useful to note the history of the negotiations of the price agreement. 6.1 and 6.4 um, were pushed quite strongly by the parties with vested interest in CDM. And uh, 6.8 was added at the last minute to placate some of the countries like the uh, ELBA, which is a group of um, Latin American countries around, which are quite left social democracies, democratic socialist countries like Bolivia, Venezuela, and a group of countries around them. Um, they actually wanted to ensure that Article 6 did not just talk about markets and markets alone. That's why Article 6.8 came to be. 
Um, so if Article 6.8 goes ahead without 6.2 and 6.4, some, some observers and players might see it as a sign that uh, the momentum behind 6.2 and 6.4 is lost and that 6.8 will be the only way going forward, which means that it will more kind of replicate um, the other um, transfer mechanisms in uh, Article 9 and 10 and 11. So that how that would result how that will affect the CEM projects remains to be seen. Option three, kicking the can down the road. Um, there's also an option of simply uh, agreeing to some very bare bones uh, principles, creating an executive body, uh, and then letting the executive body set up the rules. So you, you take out the political, some of the political um, influences out and put some technical expertise in. That's one way of uh, approaching the problem, but are countries prepared to let go of the control, their control over the negotiations? So we don't know. And uh, then uh, there's option four. Quite interestingly, um, IKO's course here, the carbon offset uh, platform that the civil, the international aviation sector has decided to use, they were actually waiting for COP25 to create an Article 6 result before they uh, released the uh, list of um, um, credits that could be used for their offset mechanism. But instead, because there was no outcome for Article 6 last year, Corsair went ahead and released its uh, list of um, accepted credits. So you have some like VERA, uh, otherwise known as VCS, Gold Standard, which WWF is a partner of. Um, you also had some smaller organization, but by far the largest one was the CDM and GI. So um, that means that you can now use CDM credits towards uh, Corsia. Uh, that could be an option for um, the Article 6. They could simply outsource all its functions to private, um, to the voluntary sector, your VERA, your Gold Standard and others. But then the question is the CDM remains the largest uh, of the uh, credit schemes. So in that case, how do you wind down CDM? That will take quite some time. Um, and um, there will be many countries that will put up very strong opposition to winding down CDM without a central, uh, international uh, party control mechanism going forward. But well, we'll just have to see. And now uh, I think we hand over to Sandeep to discuss more about uh, adaptation and loss and damage. Uh, thank, thank you, Eric. And oh, sorry. Um, what, one last slide. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, yeah. So some things to consider. Corsia, as mentioned earlier, um, there's a slight um, mismatch between what IKO, the countries who are members of the organization, and IATA, which are uh, airlines, members of that organization, the private sector the airlines want to go forward uh, for 50% reductions in emissions from 2005 level. Uh, Corsia only achieves net neutrality. So there's a difference there. Uh, CBD draft goes 2030. 30% uh, of Paris Agreement emission reduction are meant to be achieved by nature-based solution in the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is a separate convention. Um, so that will be a boost for nature-based solutions, but whether it will flood uh, as Article 6 just like it did with um, CDM remains to be seen, slightly concerning. Uh, carbon clubs, EU is quite uh, adamant about going forward with border carbon tax adjustment. So the EU could become a carbon club. Uh, there are other carbon clubs in the negotiation, but the EU is the largest one. So going ahead, well, Article 6 would, would lead to conflicting regimes. If let's say there's a different set of rules in the EU, uh, and at the UN, we don't know. Uh, domestic carbon pricing. Some, some countries like Singapore, we have a carbon price, um, $5 a ton. Uh, some are higher. Um, in Canada, it's going up 30, 40, 50 by, in the next few years. So the question is, if countries really have mandatory minimum carbon pricing, um, the idea is that they would reduce their carbon emissions per ton. That would also um, reduce the demand for uh, carbon offsets as well. So how this works out, how this interplays uh, 
we will have to wait for a global stock update to see how some of the early adopters of carbon pricing, uh, how they affect the emissions going forward. Uh, conflicting fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, a lot of countries still have um, sub subsidized fossil fuels directly or indirectly. Uh, whether this will create more demand, less demand, uh, whether that means the fossil fuel sector will end up being the biggest customer of Article 6.4. It could happen. Uh, that's not a sight that would be that would be quite telling. Um, but then again, with the price of oil dropping quite significantly in the past few months, there could be um, more uptake of fossil fuel, or there could be um, less supply of fossil fuel. We don't know. And uh, of course, lack of clarity regarding market demand, which I've been saying all this time, we may end up having to wait for 2023, uh, two cops down the road. No, um, three cops down the road um, before we see any results for Article 6. Now this, uh, now this is the time that I hand over to Sandeep finally for adaptation and loss and damage. Thank you. Th thanks, Eric. And um, that's, that's for, the, uh, for the newcomers. My name is Sandeep Samming Rai. I'm a WF employee and I deal with the global adaptation and the policy work based in Singapore office. Um, and what we have heard earlier is, is, is on the mitigation aspect as well as the market aspect. Now I'm, I'm really talking about the, uh, the, the other aspect about the, the impacts. The, because the climate change has, has three, I would say three key, uh, I would say basically it has two uh, effects. One is, is you, you reduce the emissions by all different means and that's called mitigation and you add up with the climate impact and you build resilience and, and, and that's the second second part of the coin in, in this climate debate so and, and adaptation and loss and damage is the second part of the of, of the whole climate system I mean, because for many vulnerable countries even country like singapore i'm just giving an example uh, adaptation will be one of the key priority because of our vulnerability of sea level rise like uh, in terms of our geographical locations, in terms of the food security, because we import a lot of food from the from the external partners, or uh, from the external um, beyond our our borders, and and a lot of other uh, stresses because of our geographical constraint. So adaptation is also a really critical component part. So I will talk about the adaptation, which is the Article Eight of the of the Paris, uh, sorry, Article Seven of the Paris Agreement, and and. Before giving whatever the key outcomes of the COP25 on adaptation, let me highlight how the adaptation evolved within the, the climate, con climate convention. Um, as we all know, uh, the, the Kyoto Protocol, uh, before Kyoto Protocol, the, the, the UNFCCC really was formed in 1992, and it has its various articles, and I think it's Article 2 where it talks about the, the building resilience and, and adapt to the climate impact, and especially highlighting the food system. Um, and we have the we have the Kyoto Protocol, 1997. But within the Kyoto Protocol, it was heavily the top-down efforts and mostly dealt with the mitigation aspect. And the CDM was also part of the mitigation thing. But the adaptation came only in 2001 as a Maracas uh, in terms of Maracas Accord, where. Uh, some of the vulnerable countries like least developed country if you talk about least developed country in the ASEAN region is like say, Myanmar or, or, or Laos some of the least developed country they, their contribution in the mitigation was really negligible and they are not the primary really, uh, countries to, to create climate crisis but they are the, 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 the victim of the climate crisis uh, so in 2001 the least developed country was asked to prepare the the origin and immediate adaptation needs. And as a result, the National Adaptation Program of Action, which is called NAPA, NAPA was established, the least developed country fund was established, and the Special Climate Change Fund was also established under the Climate Convention to support adaptations into, into, into this whole picture and bringing the developing country or the least developed country who are the least responsible but highly vulnerable from the climate impact into this picture. And that, that moves on, and that also reflects into the Paris Agreement as of the Article, Article, um, Article 7. And 
let me talk about what happened in COP25 on this adaptation space. Though we don't have NAPA at this current time, uh, it's been implemented in the LDC countries where most of, I think 50 of the LDC countries are already implementing their, their NAPA, which is also an immediate need. But the second phase of the, of the NAPA, you know, which is called National Adaptation Plan, or NAPS, which basically identify the medium long term of, of country needs is one of the key components and that was decided in COP25. NAPA is, is not a new, uh, NAPS is not a new in the UNMTPC process because it was firstly established in 2010 under the Cancun Adaptation Framework and for the last 10 years so far only 20 countries have submitted their mid and long term adaptation needs and many of the countries when you talk about the NDC, and in, in, within the NDC, the commitment, uh, many of the developing countries put forward what is their, their priority as a result of NAPS you know, exercise. Or those countries who have not really done their NAPS, they will say, based on the NAPS priority, we will, will revisit, uh, we, we will submit the adaptation um, contribution towards the NDC. I'm just giving an example like, like Philip, like uh, let's say Pakistan or Madagascar has put forward NAPS as a as their uh, adaptation commitment. So in last COP, uh, basically for the last ten years, there was not much big progress on countries to produce their meat and long term adaptation need. So it was the COP make a decision and request the SBI in conjunction with the adaptation committee and this type of country expert group or we call LEC, to identify what are the gaps and need and for the implementation of the NAPS and, and how that can be further enhanced. So this, that's one of the key components. But the second key uh, decision, well, on my experience for the last 70 years in the UN process, it was the first time which has really it highlighted the essential contribution of the nature to address climate change and impact and the need to address the biodiversity loss and climate change in an integrated manner. And, and, that's, and that was really good, I would say, uh, uh, decision that took place uh, in, in the in the COP under the Chile-Metri time of action and uh, time of action and uh, for a conservation organization like the Wood of I think I think this was one of the key I would say outcome for us because in, in the current pandemic nobody can decline that that nature really plays a big role for us and if you really screw nature that the nature will really penalize us I think this pandemic we can definitely we all are be witnessing I mean the whole world is on this on this crisis so so the climate convention has also really really bought that the essential bought that and also so on um, took a note of the essential contribution of nature and that's one of the only critical component and as well as the same cup also to, to invite or I would say welcome the standing committee on finance and to dedicate 2020 forum on the financing the nature-based solution. I think that's, that's a really big step forward. Uh, this is Standing Committee on Finance Forum was supposed to take place in, in February. Uh, this year is not taking because, because of this, this crisis and most likely it will take place either or, or September or October this year, depending upon how, the, how this crisis goes on. Well, apart from that, uh, there were also other, other key aspects uh, that has really a good outcome in adaptation in COP25. The first one is to, to convene a dialogue uh, on the ocean and climate change you know, in a very integrated, matter, in integrated manner in terms of how the ocean and climate change can be studied further for the mitigation and, and adaptation action and as well as to convene a dialogue be, between the land and climate change adaptation because that is really key uh, in, in a couple of aspects. The IPCC had made it very clear into their ocean and cryosphere report in terms of the, the ocean and its link with the climate change. And, and so do the land and climate change adaptation is really key, especially if we are talking about the rate mechanism, reducing emission from deforestation and forest degradation, the rate plus. And lastly, really under the Article 7.1 of the Paris Agreement, where the Paris Agreement talks about the global goal on adaptation of building resilience, reducing vulnerability and vulnerability. So the CMA also requests this adaptation committee to review the, what overall progress has been made on achieving the global goal and reflect its outcome in, in its report in 2021 because that will really feed in to the global stock tech process as that takes place in year 2023. And because global stock tech will take a stock of 
where we are in climate in the, in the climate world and where we want to hit and how to hit the 1.5 and how to be climate resilient in the long term in, in long term horizon. So I think achieving the overall progress on global volume on adaptation is really key to just the assessment. Next one, please. And you know, what could be the, some of the possible outcome uh, on adaptation? Uh, let me let me highlight a few of them. This is entirely mine, and but I assume this may be maybe almost eighty to ninety percent true. If it's hundred percent true, then I will be really happy. But but this is where we we might be heading on. The firstly, we def, I think the COP really needs to to agree on work plan on ocean and climate change. I think that's and because the UNSG secretary also really moved, pushing strongly on on the on the ocean and climate agenda and and this is really critical not only for the land of country but also the the, the small island country like singapore as well because ocean plays a very critical role not only the only the climate system but also the whole supply of the food and so many things and, and so there needs to be some agreement on ocean and climate change at this particular cop secondly there should be some decision on land and climate change adaptation as a part of the dialogue because that will that will somehow address the whole land issue because whether we like it or not i think land also contributes almost uh, close to 30 to 40, uh, 20 to 30 percent of the global emission and uh, and it's, it's it's moving rapidly because of the land use and land exchange and forestry so i think land also plays a very big vital role on both reduce on the mitigation aspect as well as the adaptation aspect as well so something decision needs to take place on that part. The third one would be the how the how the gaps and need on terms of implementing NAPS can be done. Some decision needs to take place. And fourth one, the nature based solution uh, and is is really coming up quite strongly. And just 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 in the case of Singapore, now NUS is NUS has established the nature based solution climate research institution institute in Singapore. And that gives the importance of nature based solution as we move along. And this is also a, a point where the, both the CBD COP and the climate COP can also come together because this is a very essential aspect. And in the, in the climate debate, the nature-based solution is really coming strongly, but outside the UN, outside the UN negotiation space, and the last COP has really opened the window inside as well. So this particular COP, the COP26, needs to, to make a solution or, or, or needs to have a, a role of nature in the climate strategy and how to address that gap. And one of the possible uh, idea could be to agree or join SOFTA and SBI task force on nature-based solution. And that brings the article five as well as article 7.2 of the Paris Agreement. And lastly, um, um, some decision on the global goal on, on adaptation as a part of the adaptation committee report would be also one of the possible outcome on adaptation at COP26. And now let me go to the, the next um, theme of my presentation, which is loss and damage. Before I, def before I go into detail, let me highlight what the loss and damage mean, because this may be a relatively new, new topic in the climate negotiation. There is no, I would say, every definition on loss and damage, but thus many people or many article talks about Last NMS is impacts of climate change due to insufficient effort to reduce greenhouse gas emission and inadequate adaptation action. For example, we are already hitting towards 3 degree or 4 degree plus wall. The impacts what we are facing right now at 1.1 degree will not be same. We will will not be a same level of impact in the future. The impact will be much more drastically and where and that's those kind of impacts we can count as loss and damage and loss and damage basically the UN defines as the economic losses and non-economic losses just to give example in terms of economic loss means means loss of um, loss of infrastructure loss of your property or loss of your business operation is economic losses and non-economic losses could be the individual loss like loss of life loss of health loss of mobility or I would say social society loss less loss of territory when the entire country submerged under the sea see, or you need to relocate from one place to another and that's a loss of social uh, loss of society and loss of environment we talk about loss of biodiversity the biodiversity and species the loss of ecosystem services we are already facing that and these are some of the 
some of the issue that is defined under the loss and damage within the climate negotiation process. And it is the article eight of the Paris Agreement really talks about the loss and damage. Next one, please. And in 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 last cop uh, in last cop, uh, let me before talking about last cop, the loss and damage really came into picture in two thousand eight under the post post nine. But before that, on the, in two thousand seven during the Bali action plan, loss and damage was was really highlighted over there, but really took momentum during post nine cop in two thousand eight. And but uh, loss and damage was really controversial for especially with the whole issue of, of compensation regime and, regime and that make it really, really uh, hard in terms of defining in loss and damage and agreeing loss and damage into the, into the global agreement. But, it, but some of the great uh, decision took place before the Paris Agreement, it was in, in Warsaw. So in, in 2013, where they established the Warsaw International Mechanism and unlike everything in the UN process, all the, all the agreement or all these mechanisms needs to review on time to time. So the, the WIM was supposed to be reviewed in 2019 uh, after seven years. There was two years initially and five years. So in 2019, the review of the WIM was done. And the, the main highlight of the review of the Warsaw International Mechanism or the WIM is, is whether the WIM really meet the function of, of what it was supposed to be. And if not, then how it can further extend them. And there was two critical component on that part. One is, is what kind of technical support the WIM can provide to uh, developing countries or developing vulnerable countries to address loss and damage and where the money to address loss and damage comes from. So these were two issues that was heavily debated, but basically the finance was much, much more strongly won. So the COP, so the last COP really established a Santiago network as a technical uh, network to assist or to provide a technical assistance on loss and damage to developing countries. The, and also the last COP also established the expert group under the WIM, under the executive of the WIM, uh, that will engage with the standing committee on finance and also pro and, and provide the recommendation as well as guidance to the financial mechanism under the convention and so in terms of how the developing country can access finance. And, and the standing committee on, on, on finance will really look into the financing aspect of the loss and damage. But one of the big push especially from the developing country as well as the from the civil society for the last crop was very strong decision on, on loss and damage finance. But, but, but in the end, it was a bit of a weak decision and still the battle is on you know, for, the, for, for the loss and damage finance under the, under the convention as a part of the Paris Agreement Article 8. Next one. Uh, in terms of uh, what could be now the possible outcome for loss and damage in the next COP? Uh, I would say one of the one of the still debated issue is about the governance and the structure of the Warsaw International Mechanism. Because when the Paris Agreement came in, then the, uh, the governance of the WIM is, was under the CMA, I mean under the Paris Agreement. But now, since the US is pulling out, there is a lot of uh, uh, there is a lot of I would say. Um, uh, uncertainty within the CMA uh, and COP is much more beyond the CMA. So there is also a strong push to to have a, a, a win a reporting either to both reporting to COP and the CMA or just to the COP. So this question is still ongoing. We have to see how that goes and that could be one of the key this outcome from the COP26. Second, the institutional arrangement of the Santiago Network on Loss and Damage in terms of the scope, the mandate, the structure, and the composition of this technical network of, of loss and damage will be established, uh, will need to be finalized by this by upcoming COP and the funding and guidance to the financial mechanism to the convention, especially to the Green Climate Fund, and as well as to other financing mechanism on the defendant. And one of our wish lists to be uh, to say is that a, a kind of COP decision on loss and damage finance mechanism on the defendant. Because loss and damage is really, really is, is beyond adaptation and mitigation and, that, and how that can be how that can be resolved and how and we need to somehow resolve on that particular issue so one of the key yeah, I would say expectation from conference is to a kind of decision on loss and damage finance and, and on that aspect so let me stop there and I will hand over uh, to Melissa for next one thank you okay, thank you so much Sandeep and uh, thanks to everyone for bearing with us uh, so I will cover some of the 
COVID-19 uh, impacts on the court process. Uh, I thought this slide uh, was is very interesting to set the context for uh, how COP26 uh, should or maybe should not approach uh, the the issue uh, of CO2 reduction. Essentially, if you see the slide here, it was prepared by the Met Office and um, uh, these lines that are drawn uh, represent the amount of uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Uh, when we were discussing this slide as uh, the panelists yesterday, actually uh, one of the issues pointed out by Eric incidentally was that um, where is the drain, <laughs> right? So you have the, the CO2 actually bubbling over um, and there's no way to actually reduce it or uh, get it out of the atmosphere, right? So this is something that uh, is, is good to set the tone about uh, the fact that the pandemic uh, that's happening right now is, is seemingly helping to slow the increase in uh, CO2 emissions, uh, but at the same time, uh, when countries are going into recovery, this uh, rate of increase might actually uh, tip us over. And that's what we're concerned about. The, um, the new dates for COP26 have only just been announced, actually just last week, and uh, it will be happening on the 1st to the 12th of November 2021. Uh, I believe it's going to happen in Glasgow as announced. Uh, the UK is in partnership with Italy, and incidentally, both of them are also respectively the president of uh, G7 and G20, and they will be using these platforms to ma maintain the momentum for climate action from with uh, in 2020 going into 2021. Uh, this will also affect the dates of the next COP, which was supposed to be uh, done in uh, Africa, uh, and they were supposed to host it in 2021, but the, because COVID has uh, caused a delay and postponement, uh, this will also affect the timeline that the African group will host uh, this meeting. Now, uh, Decision 1 CP21, which was what I mentioned earlier, the text that has to be read together with the Paris Agreement, includes a paragraph uh, 25, which talks about when the NDCs will have to be submitted. So officially, we know this as every five years, right? It's a ratchet up mechanism. Uh, it increases, uh, countries are supposed to increase their ambition every five years. However, because of the ambiguity in this particular paragraph, um, countries may choose to read it literally um, and submit the NDCs next year instead because it, uh, paragraph 25 relates to a particular COP and not the year. Okay, so the fact that uh, COP has been delayed by a year means that we might see NDC submissions uh, coming in a year later than they would normally. Um, and also we, we keep in mind that countries uh, are uh, going through some difficult times now with uh, uh, dealing with COVID-19. And so we may also see delays because of uh, the efforts to stem the impacts. Uh, this will have a, a, a impact on the global stock take in 2023, we expect, and affect the start of the new carbon market under Article 6. Uh, for those of you who, um, who would like to continue to keep track of what's happening at the COP, uh, there actually are some ongoing talks, uh, meetings uh, this, this week. Uh, talks is actually not a, a great term because officially negotiations are off the table for now uh, until October. But in fact, uh, it is also not clear whether the October meeting uh, will actually go ahead because uh, of safety, safe distancing requirements that have not been clearly articulated yet by the UNFCCC Secretariat and uh, the UK Presidency. So if you're interested, please, uh, the slides will be uploaded onto uh, the Epsel website uh, later on and you can click on this link or you can just uh, punch in uh, to your browsers unfccc.int and it'll take you to the June Momentum page. Okay, so I will hand over to Eric who will cover uh, the US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. Yes, thanks Ralph. So um, this slide, just the picture alone, um, a bit of a classic. Um, it's from Casablanca, the famous line will always have Paris. So um, with or without the US, our position is that there'll always be the Paris Agreement. So um, getting into the dates, right? Um, so we know that um, the US announced its pull-out on Paris Agreement in, on 1st of June 2017. But according to the, uh, to the Paris Agreement itself, Article 28 states that uh, parties, after they sign on their agreement, they can only withdraw three years after um, the agreement has entered into force for that party. So uh, for the US, it entered into force um, together with the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world at least, 
um, I think it was November. Um, let's do the F now. I think it was November 1 7. Um, so, uh, any withdrawal will take effect after one year after they submit the uh, letter for of withdrawal. So, the US, according to this, was only allowed to submit its withdrawal on 4th of November 2019. So, that is three years after 2016, which is when it entered the force for um, the US. So, not 17 but 16. So, uh, it had to wait one year before it could actually leave the Paris Agreement. So that one year brings us to 4th of November 2020. Now, um, it's worth noting that the US presidential elections are on 3rd of November. And uh, it, the thing about this period between uh, 3rd of November and, um, f and, f and um, okay, so, if you also know how the US presidential election works, right? The new president only sworn in in January 2021. So that gap between um, the election and the swearing in is, as well as the electoral college having to meet and to cast its votes for the president, because it's not a single uh, national election, but 50 different state elections that has to be combined together at the electoral college. So um, that period of time, the US is definitely out of the agreement now. Um, the COP was originally meant to occur in uh, late November, early December. So the question was, what would the US be doing at uh, COP26? Uh, we don't know because um, under the rules, if you are not, if you are party to the main UN C of 92, but not of the Paris Agreement, according to the rules of procedure, you would be allowed to sit in uh, the Paris Agreement uh, conference or the meeting of parties serving as a part, uh, meeting to agreements, the CMA, um, but you'll not be able to vote. So you have to white black card. But when you get back to the UN C, you will still be allowed to vote. And the, the important thing is that all the resolutions uh, of the CMA will go to the court for final approval. So that means the US still managed to retain its, its vote in the court. So that's a bit concerning. Um, so does the US, so uh, all the Democrat candidates, including Joe Biden, have stated that one well, of their first acts in office would be to sign the price agreement again, to re-enter the price agreement, because they would have left on 4th of November, but before the new president gets sworn in. So if Joe Biden, or in fact, Joe Biden wins, then he would have to sign agreement once again, and the same Article 26 rules will apply to him again. So he, even if he wanted to leave, uh, it, he wouldn't be allowed to leave in his first term of office. Second term of office, maybe. But the point is he, that the lock-in was designed to lock. Um, if, I, if you believe the negotiators, it was meant to lock in any future US president. But clearly, it's not doing a very good job of it. Because 3 plus 1, you know, it's a four-year term in the US presidency is a four-year term. Uh, if Trump wins, obviously he, he will want to join back in. Uh, that's, that's fairly obvious. Um, there has been a report from the McIntosh Center from the George Mason University stating that US COVID-19 damage is at least two trillion, could be even more, uh, considering how they have uh, managed or not managed the, the, the uh, COVID-19. Uh, it's about 10% of US annual GDP. I see someone actually asked, so what would be the impact of the US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement? So uh, rather than address that question, I thought I'd just very briefly, very briefly now with your permission to just address this very quickly. Um, my position is this. Well, the US has been trying to have its cake and eat it. Uh, so it's trying to have it both ways. It's trying to be part of the, uh, the US but not part of the Paris Agreement. Uh, for the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage. It actually wanted the WIM to be funded entirely by Paris Agreement parties, but it also wanted a seat on the management board of the WIM. And uh, of course, all the outcomes from the Paris Agreement uh, CMA would still be subject to a vote from the US, which in the process, all our resolutions are uh, passed by consensus. That means that any one country can block any resolution. So the US, I think they very well know this and they know that even without being part of the Paris Agreement, they could block 
anything that they don't like coming out of the Paris Agreement, uh, CMA. So uh, if you ask me, I think the bureaucrats at the State Department know this as well. They might actually advise um, any new incoming president that being one foot in, one foot out is more um, positive and more beneficial to US own interests. But uh, how this will affect the world, frankly speaking, I know um, some countries actually want the US to be out of the uh, main conference altogether. So I think that gives you a sense of where parties are at in terms of where they feel the US is. And we'll wait to see. But I think that's, that's all I can say for now. So thanks everyone for uh, being so patient. And uh, I think we'll go forward to address some of the questions in the Q&A box. Mel? Hey, thank you so much, Eric and Sandeep. I really appreciate both of your expertise in, in the respective areas. And we can already see the questions coming in. So just to remind everybody, perhaps if you join late, we have uh, a Q&A function that you can write your questions in. And uh, we already see about 10 or 11 questions. Some of you have also engaged each other in discussion. So please continue to uh, ask your questions in the Q&A uh, text box or function uh, on Zoom. Uh, instead of the chat room, uh, that's where we'll be answering the questions, okay? So um, there are a couple of questions uh, actually that, and you can also place, or, uh, you can also upvote questions uh, that you agree with or you want answered uh, first. Uh, and perhaps I will uh, address the first question. Uh, Eric, I think you're up next. There are a number of carbon market related questions. So yes. I'll give you a heads up, a heads up yes, now. Yes, I, I have looked at some of them. Yep. Right, okay. So, and if you have any questions that you would like to, address to any particular speaker or panelist, uh, myself, Eric or Sandeep, you can also type uh, our names uh, at the start of your question so we know they're addressed specifically to us. Otherwise, we will take it, uh, I will decide who based on the, the topic that's been addressed. Interest. Okay, great. So Tongi has asked this question, uh, which has been upvoted five times. So I would like to take that first. Uh, he's asked, in terms of global climate action, what would be an ambitious target to strive for in Glasgow 2020? Okay, it's going to be 2021. All right, COP26. Uh, can developing countries afford the carbon cutbacks that would curtail their developmental goals? Okay, so we're answering, answering this question now. Um, so the issue here is actually with COVID-19, many countries will be focused and are focused uh, on COVID-19 recovery efforts. So stimulus plans, uh, not unlike the ones that have been uh, announced in Singapore. So we've had four budgets so far, uh, three of which are addressing uh, the e economic effects of uh, COVID-19 on Singapore. All right, so you have this issue where uh, countries are actually right now focused a lot on uh, recovery. Uh, in terms of developmental goals for countries, yes, absolutely. I think the fact that the nationally determined contributions, okay, NDCs, the pledges are 100% are determined by the countries themselves. Uh, I'm fairly certain that countries will actually include uh, the impact of COVID-19 in the NDCs. So instead of perhaps more ambitious NDCs, unfortunately, you might find countries maybe restating their targets uh, for, for the 2020 NDC uh, because they're not, not sure. They, they, there's, there's a principle of non-regression under this uh, Article 4 of the Paris Agreement. So you would probably see countries maintaining the same level, right? Uh, moving forward. So, and I think this might only get worse as uh, if countries don't, haven't already submitted their NDCs. As of uh, a couple of days back, I, I, I looked up the submissions and there are only 10. There are only 10 countries that have submitted NDCs this year. Uh, and the first NDCs, uh, there were 182. So this just gives you a, this, a sense of uh, how far back we are in terms of uh, NEC submissions. Um, okay, so I, uh, perhaps we can move on to uh, Eric's, the questions that are asked yes. Eric. Yeah, you there are quite there? a number of questions on CDM, so I will um, try to answer uh, of most, if not all of them, um, to some extent, because uh, as, as mentioned earlier, um, CDM transition is part of Article 6. Um, some of these things uh, are not going to be uh, resolved in the short term. 
But we can look at um, the draft outcome from um, last year's COP um, dated uh, 15 December uh, 1 10 a.m., which tells you exactly how late this uh, draft came out last year. So um, you look at, um, so I'm looking at uh, paragraph 72. It states that pro project activities and programs will, in general, go through the supervisory body, which is the new executive body for Article 6, to be approved to if they meet the new requirements for Article 6 that will be adopted going forward. And uh, it will be transistored. The draft is December 31st, 2023. I don't know whether that date will still stand when we come back to it in, in uh, COP26. Um, but in general, there will be a process of um, bridging CDM to Article 6. That's um, the project itself. As for existing credits, uh, you look at paragraph 75, you will see that um, projects that there will be a cutoff date. Um, credits must be um, issued before it says here December 31st, 2020. Again, don't know whether it will change going forward. Uh, and they must be used towards NDCs um, or in other words, the global stock take for each country's uh, uh, their accounts by 31st December 2025. So there's envisage a certain amount of crossover uh, for credits, but these credits will all expire according to this current draft by the end of 2025. So there is a certain reticence by many parties to enter CDM now, which is understandable because the CDM is meant to be wound down. It was meant to be wound down at COP24. It's only because we couldn't achieve an a outcome for Article 6 that the CDM is still in holding pattern right now. CDM executive board, um, understandably, they are also in the holding pattern right now because there's really nothing that they can really do about it right now because they don't know um, they haven't been given instructions by CMP, the convention serving as a meeting for parties to cure a protocol to wind down officially. They have to wait for CMA to adopt a decision saying that, okay, let's wind down cure protocol. Then, um, sorry, wind down CDM. Then CMP can then adopt a decision saying, okay, here's how you wind down the CDM. Uh, until then, uh, I can see that the voluntary sector will become more popular as things go on. For the first time, the World Bank uh, State and Trends of Climate, uh, State and Trends of Carbon Pricing 2020. This is the first year that there's an entire chapter on voluntary markets. So they actually go through all the major uh, voluntary markets like Vera, Gold Standard, uh, CDM, GI. So they actually, this is the first time that World Bank is actually taking notice of this. So this actually gives you a very good sense of where uh, the global markets, they are sensing is going on this issue. And so I think we we have a, I think this is actually a very good alternative for investors wanting to get into this market now, or just waiting to see what's going to happen in Article 6, and wanting to do um, CSR right now. Um, so that's that question. Um, I also see a question on international transport. Um, the Corsair and um, this, um, the International Maritime I'm Organization, what they are going to do. So what we know is that IKEA is fixed with Corsia, yeah? net neutrality, and any further reductions will be done through um, new technologies and new um, biofuels, which has its own concern in terms of land use as well. But that's the path they're going forward. I IATA, the Association for the Airlines, they want to reduce by half over 2005 levels by 2050. Uh, for IKEA, the, the baseline is 2020, so-called 2019-2020 average emissions, but since 2020 will probably be at least a great step down from 2019. I don't know whether 2020 emissions will still be taken into account or whether they'll just use 2019 as a baseline. So that again is a big question for the international aviation sector, but we know what their policies are. IMO has stated they want to have a 50% cut of emissions by over 2005 level to 2050. But they have not actually stated how they're going to do it. They're still discussing how they want to do it in the IMO's uh, MEPC, the uh, Maritime Environment Protection Committee, which is a subcommittee. It's a committee of the IMO. 
Um, the most popular things that we hear right now is a uh, tax on bunker fuels. You have to remember that all bunker fuels sold for international transport, whether it's aviation or shipping, are currently tax-free because of certain arrangements and agreements and conventions. So, for so the the plan right now is maybe they want to impose a tax at when you refuel your ship. So that's one uh, possibility. Um, and I would like to address one more question before I go away on um, this um, city. I think city said something about um, the issues about um, uh, nature-based solutions. I will let Sandeep address uh, for adaptation and loss in there. I mean, but for mitigation, um, there, there is actually a lot of interest in uh, nature-based solution for mitigation as well. Uh, in terms of uh, growing trees. I, I know this growing trees thing, there has been a lot of debate about whether growing trees help to offset emissions. My, what I understand is that it's not going to be a complete solution, but it will have some amount of impact on our emissions. Just the, the magnitude of it is a question. We, we shouldn't be treating it as a silver bullet, but we should be growing more trees in general anyway. But we also have to take note whether we're growing them in naturally, uh, regeneration of forests, reforestation, or are we doing monoculture, which will uh, mean that these trees are very susceptible to uh, diseases and other issues, as well as um, whether they are actually absorbing the amount of carbon we think that they are absorbing. Uh, blue carbon solutions are also getting quite popular in terms of um, trying to regenerate, restore the ocean to good health, restore the corals to good health so that the ocean can uh, continue to be a sink for carbon dioxide, uh, carbon emissions, uh, but the standards and um, standards for that still up in the air. But there is a group of countries called um, I, can't, I can't remember what the group of countries is called, but it's led by surprisingly Monaco, I think, uh, who who actually put out a pretty fancy uh, publication last year called uh, stating what they want to push for because. Uh, unlike forests, which has Article 5.2 in Paris Agreement, oceans don't actually get mentioned anywhere by name. So that's, they only get mentioned by reference back to the UN ACCC 92 uh, Convention, uh, which does mention, if I'm not wrong, uh, coastal and marine ecosystems, but, in, but uh, in the Paris Agreement, not really. So that's for mitigation. Sandy, I'll let you answer adaptation. Okay, <clears throat> just, just to interrupt, sorry. Uh, thanks, Eric, so much for um, all the great answers. Uh, you, I think you addressed like five questions there. Um, yeah. Before we, uh, I allow Sandeep to take City's question, uh, just uh, to update, she also has uh, included in the, uh, a note to us in the chat box uh, specifically. Um, <clears throat> clarifying her question. Um, at the same time, I also like to wish everybody a happy World Environment Day. Actually, the theme for this year's World Environment Day is uh, nature and biodiversity. So, Sandeep, I'd like to ask you to answer um, City's question. Uh, thanks, Mel, and happy World Environment Day, everybody. I think the City's question, and it was liked by 10%, so let me try to respond on top of what Edith said. And her question is basically, is it about the speaker mentioned that there is some alignment synergy between Paris Agreement and the Convention on Biological Diversity. Do you see any mechanism for boosting carbon, from boosting carbon offsetting pricing from nature-based solution projects that can go back into conservation financing? I think that's a very, very good question. And to be, to be very honest, it's already happening. And if, if you remember, if you remember RED, RED mechanism of REDG, it doesn't really talk only about tree planting, but it talks about the about the reducing emission from um, deforestation and forest degradation. So, and so, 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 so that's the key. That's the key aspect. And whether we like it or not, under the climate regime, there will be a mechanism of the carbon offsetting, and this will definitely this this will definitely come into in, into picture about nature based solution project. The hurdle that I see over there because the carbon credit as a, as a mechanism is to reduce your carbon footprint. The bigger question over there is those projects whose goals, those nature-based solution projects whose goals under the carbon credit uh, crediting mechanism, that needs to be ensured that those 
let's say either you talk about the ecosystem, the, 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 the pristine ecosystem, or those trees remains there during the lifetime of the project cycle. I don't know about, let me give example of the CDM. The CDM project cycle, cycle varies in two terms. The first is you can develop CDM project for 10 years and 10 years for whole 21 years, at 20 years, or seven plus seven plus 11 in 20, up to 21 years. So whatever we do on the nature-based solution, and if we are making that into CDM project, then the carbon stock that is over there needs to be there, uh, needs to be there. I, th I think that's the key. Uh, because the climate only understand from the carbon point of view, they need and, and the amount of ton of carbon that needs to be reduced down. And the biodiversity and everything, they, these are will be the co-benefit from the from the climate point of view. And 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 they're justifiable. So in short, yes, but we need to detail narrow down in terms of the the carbon accounting and also ensuring that those ecosystem or those, uh, let's say, landscape where the nature-based solution project has been injected is and will be in, will be there for remaining the project cycle of that of that carbon offset. Because as we all know, let's say, just to give example, tree is a carbon stock. But if the tree is chopped down and make a furniture, then it still is a carbon stock. But if tree is burned down, then the carbon is released into atmosphere. So you're back to zero. So, so we need to ensure that so nature-based solution project will definitely be a part of the part of the, the carbon offsetting in the future. But the mechanism, as well as the accounting, because for the, any carbon offsetting project, even in CDM, you need to do do uh, do auditing uh, when you calculate the carbon. So during those auditing period, we need to ensure that those carbon stocks is there uh, during that uh, auditing period. So, so that's the key. Hey, so let's see how it goes. It's, also, it's already there. Uh, it's already there under the red mechanism. And, and you know that I think it was Norway who was injecting close to $2 billion to Indonesia for the whole red project. And it, and it is there. So I, I see red as a nature-based solution uh, carbon trading project. Uh, people may have a different view. I think that's perfectly fine. And, and, but the ecosystem services, we, it, is bio, it is not the carbon offsetting thing. And so that may not count because from the climate point of view, for if you're talking about carbon reduction, they really looks about the about the, the ton of carbon that is reduced by that particular project. So, so that so that's the that's the point. The associate benefit and everything, I think that's the okay. Let me toss to the next question, which talks about the um, why there was a question by uh, some of our colleagues talking about why the company are not really buying CDM project but going for the ERs and gold standard. I think that's the reason. That's the the whole reason of people not going to buy CDM project but going to the ERs and the gold standard project is because of other associate benefit. The, what what City is mentioning about that other, to qualify the gold standard project. On top of the carbon uh, accounting, you also need to have uh, the other other I would say library like like ecosystem services benefit is, is it needs to the sustainable development goals. There are certain criteria to qualify any particular project to be gold standard. If it's only solely a carbon related project, then it will be a CDM project and solely a CDM project. But for other associate benefit ecosystem services, sustainable development, gender benefit, those kind of things will be if those are met then only that will be qualified at the gold standard that's why uh, and gold standard is from one wf is one of the promoter for gold standard since 2010 and we still sit in our board our wf switzerland ceo sits in the gold standard board until now you know, because of the other associate benefit uh, which is beyond the carbon so so and those associate benefit doesn't really account but as the the, I would say beauty of the carbon credit from 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 certain things. So gold standard needs to uh, well gold standard is, is is the standard that will only approve any carbon related project that has other benefit apart from on top of the carbon credit. Okay, so, so 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 that's my point. Uh, and let me also while I am talking, let me also talk uh, response Ozzy's uh, question in terms of 
you know, if global tech, we stock tech in 2013 finds that we are not in one kind of degree pathway, will the, uh, then will the major emitter go move towards the aeropace major? Let me first say, adaptation has its own limit. You, and science is making clear, and even the IPCC is saying that you can limit, you can adapt to certain limit. Once you add, go beyond that limit, you will not be able to adapt. It's like an elasticity of, of, a, of elastic. You can stretch to a certain point, it will come back, but it stays beyond that critical point, you will not, the, the elastic will not come back. And so adaptation also is the same way. And that's why the whole loss and damage came into picture when adaptation fails, when mitigation is not sufficient, loss and damage kicks in. So if in 2013, and if not, definitely we, in 2023, during the global stock take, we will definitely see that we are not heading to 1.5 degree pathway. To this 1.5 degree pathway, all country needs to be net zero by 2050, that's the target. And the world emission needs to be half by 2030 with the baseline of 2010. That's what IPCC or the science is saying. And none of the country are in that category right now. Some are good, some are not, some are really bad. So in 2023, we will, um, the, the global stock tech will definitely make sure that we are not in line to what the Paris Agreement, we all agree the 1.5 degree pathway. And the, that will be a really strong push for those who are not meeting towards that target. And they really need to push, up, push um, ahead because uh, adaptation or even loss and damage is not, uh, is not a solution. That will somehow delay the impact, delay the crisis, but mitigation is the is the primary focus, and and all countries, especially the highly emitting developing countries and the developed country, needs to be really bold enough uh, and come forward and to have a higher, I would say, uh, target in the second NDC. I think what we have seen so far, the ten NDC reverse NDC, which came into the picture, I think. The, the future is not so not so great. So the second NDC, which comes into year 2025, really needs to take into account and have a strong, I would say, as a uh, mitigation target apart from others. So let me stop there, Mel. Okay, thank you both so much for addressing the questions. Um, it's a very rich discussion in. For those of you who are still with us, uh, please uh, continue to ask questions. We are trying to answer them both uh, live as well as uh, uh, by typing out the answers to you, especially when uh, the other uh, speaker is, is still, still going on. Uh, so yes, please continue to share with us your questions on the Q&A function. Um, all right, so uh, which question should we take next? Uh, maybe I can answer one, see, seeing that both of you have been working so hard. Uh, right, okay. Um, yeah, there's one, the... NDCs. there's one on NDCs. There's uh, one on NDCs down. I think, Matt, Matthew, you, you want to take that one? I actually don't really quite... Um, uh, Matthew's one is inside NDCs and outside NDCs. Yeah. Uh, I actually don't really understand this question. Um, does it does it mean inside to the COP or like outside of the COP? I think it means that some countries' NDCs are still sector specific, and most countries should be aiming for whole of economy style NDCs. So I think that's the okay. Well, maybe we question. can we can hear me, Matthew. If you don't mind to elaborate on your question by commenting on it, then then we can we can sort of uh, let the brain. Uh, decide how to answer this question <laughs> for you. Uh, sorry about that. But um, no yeah, so please elaborate, Matthew, on your... I actually wanted to take um, the one about... Uh, so I'll briefly talk about... Uh, actually, I know, Eric, you have noted you wanted to answer this question about the US withdrawal. Um, yeah. I, could, I, could I maybe add something before you, huh. you elaborate? Yeah, why, why don't you go what first? You why don't you go first? Yeah. Okay. So um, I think maybe yeah, different people depends who you ask will have different impressions of what the U.S. Uh, withdrawal will have uh, on the climate regime, right? Um, so the U.S. was also never a party; is never a party of the Kyoto Protocol, right? So which uh, 
commits uh, 37 industrialized countries. So the US at the time was the world's largest emitter. Today, the US is the second largest emitter of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, right? second to China. And so, of course, uh, with the US uh, officially being out of the Paris Agreement by 4th of November this year is definitely you're going to see an impact um, perhaps on the emissions uh, because basically it's nothing to control it, right? That being said, I think the trend is quite clear, um, renewable energy uptake, and you've seen all sorts of news reports coming out um, in part due to COVID-19 uh, because of lockdowns and all that. Uh, emissions are actually on on the, the downward trend in the US because of uh, the increase in use of renewables and also the outgoing uh, coal sector uh, because a lot of the coal power plants are actually aged. Uh, they're very old and they're due for like decommissioning. So the question here that Christabel asked is really about uh, do we see countries following uh, the US withdrawal, right? I think this is a, a, a question we can't really give a certain answer to. I think countries will need to decide whether or not it's worth uh, if they still place their trust in the Paris Agreement. Um, the Paris Agreement is designed to be a bottom-up uh, agreement, right? So you have this, this uh, design where countries bring forward their own targets. And I think that's fundamentally where it's different from, from uh, the Kyoto Protocol, which was very much a top-down, let's have only the industrialized countries reduce 5.2% of global emissions uh, based on 1990 levels, right? So it was very onerous, very punitive. They had penalties, they had compliance team to look at uh, countries that were non-compliant. The design of the Paris Agreement is so that countries, the worst thing you can get is really help help in terms of support, in terms of technology transfer, um, perhaps even capacity building, right? So, so these are um, built-in uh, elements in the Paris Agreement that would encourage people to stay in rather than leave, right? Because if you leave, there's, yeah, you know, people really don't think very much of, I guess, um, the US because of their, their actions or Rather, maybe not the U.S. entirely, but the Trump administration specifically, because um, as Eric alluded to, any future, perhaps a Democrat uh, administration may choose to rejoin the Paris Agreement. And of course, we look forward to that day, uh, because uh, don't forget, they're still the second largest emitter in the world. Um, maybe I can also just allude to Brian's question, which is about the uh, U.S. Climate Alliance, right? 24 U.S. states and cities. Um, so there's a lot of effort uh, at the non-state level, the regional level. I know um, Professor Angel Sue at Yale and US is doing research on non-state actors. And this is absolutely important uh, because some US states actually emit more emissions, I think, than some uh, small islands, for instance. Unfortunately, um, the Paris Agreement, as with all international treaties, only recognize states' contributions. And if the US is not, not a party to the Paris Agreement, uh, then of course states can continue to be mentally in, right? Because we're still in, but uh, it's, it's very difficult to engage. Uh, not that people will stop engaging the US. I, I think everyone is still looking, hoping that they will rejoin uh, uh, beyond the Trump administration. Yeah, okay, Eric, over to you. Yeah, okay, so um, thanks, Bob. Um, I am already going to take a slightly different stance on almost everything you said. So uh, good to give the participants two different views of what we think will happen in the next few years. So um, first and foremost, um, there's a question about um, we are entering the second Cold War and how does this affect uh, future COPs? Uh, first, I'm going to put forward a counter argument in that we are not in the second Cold War. We are still in the same Cold War uh, that we were in since 1950. It's just that um, Russia and China have always been kind of aligned to each other. It's just that now that China is now the bigger brother and Russia is now the smaller brother, the younger, the smaller brother, I guess, in terms of economic size. Um, but it is still the same uh, east-west divide with the third world squished in between. We haven't really seen much of a change. There was a brief respite uh, after the Berlin Wall fell in 89 but other than that i don't think we we have actually reached we have actually left um the cold war we, we are still in the ongoing cold war but even then we've managed to create um a grand architecture of environment international environmental law beginning with the 1972 stockholm declaration the 92 rio declaration 
which also gave birth to the UN Acropole Seed and the CBD and the Convention to Combat Desertification. So regardless of whatever happens, countries know that it's still in the best interest to cooperate for most uh, environmental issues because environmental issues are by their very nature transnational. I, I don't see that there will be a great big change in terms of how we approach environmental issues. The US has always had an isolationist streak in its for uh, in its policy making. Uh, it has always had some moments where it wanted to be isolationist. Like for example, it at the end of World War One, it it urged states to create the League of Nations, but then itself didn't join. Uh, in uh, between the fifties and the eighties, they urged states, other countries, to adopt a constitution for the oceans, which resulted in the United Nations Convention for Law, the Sea. But the U.S. is not party to it either. This is not new. I I don't see the U.S. has always tried to have. Is kicking it. It's not new. And being the largest country in the world, having all the economic, the world's economies feed through the using the U.S. currency, the greenback, or, or everything, all your transactions all feed through New York City, a very small area in Manhattan. It's they 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 know they can play these kind of games, and it's not something that they're shy to use. But other countries have found ways to work around this situation. For example, if you look at the EU-Singapore Free Trade Agreement. If you flip far down, it actually binds the EU and Singapore to adhere to the climate change treaties. I think it mentions the UN, Atropocy, and Kyoto Protocol by name, actually. So it binds both countries to actually remain in the UN, Atropocy, and the Kyoto Protocol. Of course, the, when the thing was, when that chapter was negotiated, it was, I think, 2014. So, Paris Agreement hadn't come to force yet. But um, the, the EU's new generation of FTAs more or less has the same clause with all its other countries. So the EU is kind of trying to build a common club uh, by stealth in the back end, I guess. Remember the EU is a member in its own right at the UN C as well. So in terms of countries that want to leave the price agreement, uh, remember that any country which is a member of the EU will always be bound to the Paris Agreement, even if itself it leaves the Paris Agreement, unless it also chooses to leave the EU like the UK has done. But I saw the UK just put out a new ETS, which is slightly better than the EU. <laughs> so it seems that in order to trade with the EU, you must also maintain your own environmental integrity standards as well, which probably includes uh, carbon pricing. So I, I think we shouldn't be too pessimistic about uh, the developments here. I think uh, for Article 6, everyone is still waiting for global stock pick. But once global stock pick comes out, we will be able to see where the gap is. And then we, we know how many people want to start selling credits to them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So don't, don't be too disheartened by what's happening right now, but as in not be very pragmatic about what can be achieved. Then the final thing is about the US Climate Alliance of 24 states. As Mel has mentioned, international law has always been a country to country thing. Uh, it's starting to change a bit, but um, for the longest time since the Treaty of Westphalia in the 1600s, it has always been country to country agreements, and there's very little discussion about how um, non sovereign states can um, can enter an agreement with each other. There are some exceptions which I won't go into here, but um, I think we should. Um, look very carefully at what each of these states are doing. I think there's some something to be said about um, the the U.S. system in which states are meant to be laboratories of demo democracy, um, and some states have actually uh, put up very strong uh, uh, environmental commitments, like California and a few a few other states. But there is a case right now going up to the U.S. Supreme Court about the constitutionality of the link carbon market between California and Quebec. I really do hope that that one survives the constitutional challenge because otherwise uh, that would mean that all 50 states will not be able to enter into uh, their own uh, carbon markets, which would be a bit problematic in terms of how this US Climate Alliance is going to achieve its uh, individual state targets going forward. 
um, as I mentioned earlier, the EU, they have always tried to um, insert environmental clauses into their agreements wherever they can. I know as, um, as a matter of in good practice in investments, I think some of the um, international investment banks have also been inserting some environmental uh, backstops as well. So I think we, we, we shouldn't be so... I know this is a, a, a discussion about price agreement and the cops, but we should also look at where developments are in other fields and take some heart in where all these are going as well. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Eric. Okay. I just wanted to do a time check. Um, we are at 10, 10 minutes. minutes before five. So um, I hope some of so I, I see a lot of questions still that uh, we've that we've not been able to answer uh, by typing out as well. Um, I would like to focus on the Singapore questions because we are in Singapore and uh, they're, they're absolutely important questions. So I hope those of you whose answers will, may not be answered during this time, you can forgive us. Um, but please do continue to engage us. Uh, you can find our emails online. Like you just Google our names and you'll be able to find us. So we're happy to continue this conversation with you. So I would love to answer um, the question that was on Singapore's position uh, with regard to the Paris Agreement, right? So Adil Hakim has asked a question, can you share anything regarding what Singapore's negotiation strategy really the Paris Agreement is? And I would like to link this to um, the top question right now, which is how important is it for Singapore to have a green recovery? And does it seem likely that Singapore will head towards a green recovery rather than just an economic recovery? So these are both excellent questions, I think very timely to address as well. So you have, um, uh, so the Paris Agreement, COP21 was held in 2015. We are, because of the delay, we'll be trying to close up, um, you know, come full circle with the Paris rule book by uh, the end of 2021. Okay, so we have an additional year because of COVID-19. Um, so my own sense is that uh, Singapore will maintain its current negotiation strategy, which is to, uh, as much as possible, be a broker of uh, some of the very contentious, uh, you know, views when it comes to Article 6. So there are a few remaining issues on the table, right? Um, uh, so as what Sandeep mentioned, adaptation, loss and damage, you have uh, Article 6, you have transparency. And don't forget there are also existing issues under the COP, under the, the Kyoto Protocol. So the Singapore delegation, and I would strongly encourage you, if, if any of you are interested to find out who the Singapore delegation is comprised of, you can actually find this information online, right? So if you go to the UNFCCC uh, website and you click on any particular COP web page, so let's say COP25, there is always a list of participants. Okay, so it's very democratic, very transparent. You can look for this list of participants, scroll down to Singapore, or Control F Singapore, and you can actually find the names of our delegation members. And what you'll find is that they come from a range of ministries and agencies. Okay, so it's all very transparent. As I said, usually the delegation is led by somebody from the Ministry of, uh, no, sorry, it usually is the National Climate Change Secretariat. Uh, Singapore used to have a chief negotiator for climate change based at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, MFA for short, okay? Um, but this role of chief negotiator is now in the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources. Okay, so, uh, so what this means is that the Singapore position is essentially led but influenced by, of course, is led by the NCCS and MUA, but it's also influenced by all of the other agencies that are represented in the Interministerial Committee on Climate Change, okay, IMCCC for short, which includes MTI, includes EDB, and a whole host of other uh, agencies, okay, under, uh, in the government, okay, whole of government approach. Um, so Singapore will always try and find a, an outcome that, uh, because we are a player, we are one party, one state party, this means we have a voice. Uh, it is also important to keep in mind that there are much bigger players uh, in the climate negotiations. Uh, and, and I think the objective, and I think some of you who are Singaporean will appreciate this, it, we try not to become collateral damage when uh, the big, big guys fight, right? So the worry is that um, as a small country, uh, we may suffer the unintended consequences of particular decisions being made. Okay, um, so the idea is really to have an outcome that would not 
uh, disadvantaged Singapore. That's my understanding, uh, having participated and uh, observed our delegation in action. Uh, and what our strengths really are uh, for Singapore, as far as I can see, is that uh, we have our eyes and ears as, as in many places as possible. Uh, we try and understand and hear what other countries are saying, and we try and understand where their red lines are. And I think this is, is a, it's a very good strategy because then you, en you end up not polarizing the discussion. Okay, and I think one of the struggles that some of us in Singapore have, um, and even outside of Singapore have, is, is that the only role that we can play? Right, as honest broker or broker, if you don't like the word honest. But if you if you don't if you just think of Singapore just as a broker, is that enough? You know, are we putting forward uh, good enough uh, targets that are ambitious in line with IPCC 1.5, and so on and so forth? So those are great questions. Um, and Singapore, I think, as of now, as far as I can tell, it's primarily an economic recovery plan, the stimulus packages uh, that have been announced by DPM Heng. Uh, that being said, I don't see NCCS slowing down in terms of um, the plans that they have for solar energy deployment. I don't see them slowing down in terms of hydrogen uh, R&D deployment, uh, carbon capture and storage utilization R&D deployment. So I would say, like Eric alluded to, don't um, only focus on the Paris Agreement as the silver bullet or the magic bullet. You know, that I think ultimately countries have to decide for themselves what works. Um, and I think this is all part of the NDC sort of strategy, bottom-up strategy. So we may not, uh, so maybe to the question about the inside outside NDCs, yeah, countries can choose to put sectors in their, their new NDCs and there's nothing to stop them from doing that or taking out sectors if they feel that um, uh, they, they can't commit at this point, right? But, uh, okay, I would like to, to have some time for uh, Sandeep to actually chime in on this issue about uh, Singapore's negotiating strategy and um, maybe how WWF uh, perceives a country like Singapore and its position, right? And I, I, I think we are also given a, a three minute warning right now. So with Sandeep's question, then we'll, we'll tie up the entire webinar. Well, thanks, Mel. Uh, well, thanks, Mel. I think uh, th just just to highlight what you said, I think Singapore is really, really, really a good broker. And and if you look at the history of UNFCCC, it was Professor Tommy Ko who was chairing the whole, uh, who was the co-chair, uh, and as a result, the 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 UNFCCC was born, or the or the three convention was born in 1992. So thanks to Professor Tommy Ko on on that part. Uh, so. But having said that, um, I think as we as we all know, Singapore. And if if you look, let's say let's let's focus on Singapore and DC. Singapore and DC now is is much more defined. It it gives some number, uh, which is which is good in one way, uh, because in the UN process, Singapore is, is a developing country, uh, and if you consider Singapore as a developing country, the target that Singapore has put forward is is, is okay. But if you consider Singapore as a developed country, then and definitely it's not. There are many other, um, let's say, I think it's WRI or some other organization has done in terms of the country NDC targets, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, or whether it's, 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 it's really great. So, so, we, so you can look and Google that in terms of which countries is, is, is doing good in terms of meeting these Paris Agreement target or not. But having said that, whether it's developed or developing country, all the country needs to be in line of net zero by 2050 and half the emission by 2030. That was science is talking about. So irrespective of how big, big, how big economy that you have, all country needs to do to be in line with the Paris Agreement. And as of now, none of the country, including Singapore, is in, in, in that track. So, so based on science, I think all countries are really short folding. And very lastly, uh, there is one question by Ed, uh, Edris, it really talks about, uh, about the investors. And I think I really want to highlight that because that is a really good point. And, and in terms of um, so making Paris Agreement a great success, I think the investor has a big role to play. Uh, and, and when you talk about the investing, even in, in a small scale, there are many, uh, some of the investments that investor is really coming and putting forward like the green bond, really focusing on investing on the green infrastructure or green technology. There's also talking about the resilience bond. So these bonds are coming forward and they are really investing on. 
And when you engage with the company or any industry, try to choose those industries who are climate friendly and also ask them to go towards climate friendly pathway. There are many options, like one of the uh, um, program that as a WWL we run globally is science-based target, where we help company to reduce the emission based on science and in line with 1.5 degree temperature target. And in Singapore, Singtel, the CDL and Olam are the three companies who has really put forward the SBTI. So they are already championing the, the um, they are, they are, portfolio within their whole portfolio in both scope one, two, and three, they are really trying to reduce the carbon footprint. So invest into those companies you know, who are green, who have, who has a green vision, as well as, in, um, as well as help those company and industry to take certain targets that is in line with the Paris Agreement. And SBTI, the science based target that WWF, WRI, uh, UN Global Compact, and CDP is a joint initiative, is one of them. There are many others. But as, as, an, as an investor, I think you can really inject some of these, I would say, idea to the company or the industry that you want. And definitely investors or the financing sector, we need financing sector to achieve the Paris Agreement. There is no doubt on that part. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you so much. Okay, so we, we do have to wrap up this webinar. Uh, Vinod, we will, I will take up your question with you directly uh, in terms of the RECs. So it just, it just leaves me to thank uh, everybody, all of you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much for your active participation. Uh, we will be very grateful if you could uh, fill out the survey form that uh, is on the screen right now uh, by either taking a picture of the QR code and going to the, uh, or the link uh, that's provided. Uh, it will really help us in our next few uh, webinars that we'll be doing. Uh, and just keep in mind that our views that we've shared here, of course, they're not exhaustive. You can definitely uh, make up your own minds about the Paris Agreements. We've only shared our views and observations. I hope you found them useful uh, for your work uh, and or just for your general information. So I just wish you all, um, you know, to stay safe and stay well. And please continue to stay in touch with us. And uh, till our next event. Thank you very much. Thanks and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.